Well, I'm here to speak about Gordon Craig. Uh, he was my teacher and my guide in my initiation to theater. And uh, I think everything I've ever done theatrically, directing, teaching, and so forth, uh, has been Craig having inspired me. It's a continuation of that inspiration from my youth. I discovered Craig when I was 14 years of age in a history of theater book, a book that's still in print, I believe, at least in the States. It's the theater, 3,000 years of drama, acting, and stagecraft by Sheldon Cheney. And towards the end of that, uh, when it gets more into the more modern eras of theater, I saw a design by Craig. It was an early design for Hamlet. Craig later directed Hamlet in Moscow in, in cooperation with Stanislavski, in collaboration, I should say, with Stanislavski. But this was not that, this was earlier. And yet it already showed his innovation of screens, lightweight screens that can move imperceptibly through a performance. In that sense, they are acting like actors. And when they move past an actor, the actor automatically has entered without having made an entrance. So it's a very, very radical view of theater that Craig practiced at a very early age, even though today, uh, when we are in a much more advanced age, you could say, in theater, his basic approach has still not been absorbed by theater. So there I was, 14, looking at this design and reading the brief paragraph speaking about him, because it all seemed so long ago, I didn't know that he was alive, which of course he was. But uh, I said to myself, this is my teacher. And it has remained so for me in my life. He's still my teacher. Uh, that was my, my first awareness of Craig. I did make contact with him when I was 17. That's already three years. But in between times, I went to the High School of Performing Arts in New York, uh, which was new then, a public high school, uh, and yet uh, devoted to theater and dance and music. And very, very anti-Craig. They didn't like Craig's thinking, which was uh, rather well known to some of them. They were all what we used to call post-Stanislavskiites, uh, kind of acting associated with uh, the actor's studio, Lee Strasberg, if people know these American names in theater. And Craig was regarded as a kind of renegade. I remember, I remember one professor saying to me about Craig, uh, his mother, Ellen Terry, tried to make an actor out of him, but he ran away to the Florentine Hills mad at the world, as if that was all there was to say about Gordon Craig. I like to think that by today, there's a little more awareness, growing awareness of who Gordon Craig really is. And uh, I like to think that to whatever degree, I've been able to contribute to that awareness uh, by speaking to students and even directing students in a Craigian way, what I would call a Craigian way. When I was 17, a Boston magazine commissioned me to write an article uh, called, I called it, Gordon Craig and the Actor. And it was uh, published, and I hadn't even left the United States yet, not to speak of having met Craig. But the article was a good way to make a connection with him. And I corresponded with him. We had letters back and forth. And uh, 
when I was 18, that's the next year, I went to France and managed to hitchhike out of Paris, finally making it through to Vence, France, where Craig lived. And uh, I didn't know exactly when I'd arrive, but I knew it would be approximately the time I did arrive, and I let him know it. And then I got to the, the Villa Chapignac, which was a kind of hotel which had once, I suppose, been a private villa. And he lived up a flight. He had a kind of two-room apartment. And uh, I was mounting the steps, and I thought, when I get to the door of that apartment, I'll knock on it, and hopefully he'll answer, and uh, we'll meet finally. But when I was halfway up the steps, he already suddenly opened the door without seeing me. He had a plate full of breadcrumbs, which he threw out of the window, uh, a facing window, for the birds. And then he turned, and as he was going back in his apartment, he looked at me and welcomed me and explained that he liked to feed the birds, but that his landlady was angry about it and thought it made a big mess, but that he does it anyway. So I followed him into his apartment, and he turned around and peered at me. Of course, he knew who I was from the correspondence and the article which would soon be appearing. And uh, he said to me, remember, I was 18. He was 80. He said, uh, I think you look rather like me. Uh, he said, uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from New York originally. He knew we'd been corresponding to New York. I'm from the Bronx. And he said, the Bronx. I was in the Bronx, and the idea absolutely amazed me. And it turned out that he had been in the Bronx in 1884, when he was 12 years old, and he had joined his mother, Ellen Terry, and Sir Henry Irving, who was her leading man with her, and uh, joined the company on tour in the States, and he had come over for that. And then he said, uh, he, when he said I was in the Bronx, he didn't say how very long ago it was. But then he said to me, who is your mother? And when I told my mother that story, she thought, oh, what does he think? He's, that I'm somebody he met in the Bronx? And uh, of course, there was no question of such a thing, even just in time, in years. And... Uh, now I was with him, and I remember that he said to me in that first day together, he said, um, my idea has become obscured, but it will be rediscovered. A poet will rediscover it. I never forgot that, certainly. Well, from then on, I began a period of working with him every day, and actually working with him consisted largely of his sharing ideas with me, even showing me drawings and designs, like some for The Tempest of Shakespeare, that have stayed with me so much in my life that even now I'm still looking forward to directing what I'll call a Craigian Tempest, uh, based on the visions aroused by these designs. We did have some meals together, but the, uh, the meal that I remember best, because it was so special, was my 20th birthday, when he proposed to take me out for dinner at his favorite restaurant, which apparently is still there. I haven't been there recently enough to know that, but I've been told that. It's called the Villa des Roses, and uh, I believe it's in Vence, or just outside of Vence. Uh, we used to move about together, Craig and I, like going to a place like that, hitchhiking. 
I was very much a hitchhiker, and it turned out that he was too. But can you imagine uh, uh, the two of us, 18 and 80, uh, to uh, be hitchhiking together, like uh, two, uh, two companions? But it was like that. And much more recently, when I was giving workshop sessions about Craig at the Theatre Museum here in London, the Theatre Museum, which since a recent time doesn't exist, but then it did. And uh, someone asked me, what was that like to go hitchhiking with Gordon Craig? And uh, uh, I had to think for about half a minute. And then I said, well, I suppose you have to be 18 to go hitchhiking with Gordon Craig and take it in the course of things. And that's how it was. Uh, it, was it just seemed all very natural. I remember, uh, in fact, it may have been the very day that we went to the Villa des Roses that we were picked up, not by someone who recognized Craig, which many people in the area did, but by a young English uh, vacationer. He had rented a, a convertible and was driving with it and stopped for us. And uh, we both got into his back seat and uh, 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 Mr. Craig, as I would call him then, always really, Mr. Craig said, uh, I am Edward Gordon Craig. And the fellow turned around and said, how do you do? I'm Joel Ferguson, very pleased to meet you. But he had never heard of Edward Gordon Craig, whereas uh, the way Craig said it, it would be like somebody giving the name of, uh, of the king uh, or the queen and, uh, and be amazed that, that somebody didn't immediately show surprise and a strong impression. But no, this was just somebody who thought, well, if he tells me his name, I'll tell him mine. And he let us out. And I do think it was the night we went to the Villa des Roses. And the night was, the evening was so important to me that I remember it quite clearly. Uh, the waiter came and Craig ordered first and he ordered grilled sardines. And I would have never dreamed of ordering anything different than what he ordered. So I also ordered grilled sardines. Though on my own, I doubt whether I would have thought I would like it at all. Though it turned out I did. And we were eating the grilled sardines and drinking an astonishing amount of wine. I, I think we got uh, completely smashed. In any event, uh, when, we, when he first tasted the sardines, he said to me, it's good, isn't it? And th then he said, like an afterthought, uh, a bit rich. I never forgot that. He was drawing and he was writing. Yes, and I, I remember very keenly uh, the main room. His apartment was of lar one large room with a window going out onto a kind of small terrace like what they would call a porch in the United States, at least, uh, outside that room. F a little further in, he, there was a small bedroom that was his bedroom. But otherwise, he was in this large room, and on the wall was uh, a drawing of his screens, his idea of a movemented stage uh, done uh, with color, color which suggested the use of light because he didn't believe in color that was just painted on. He believed in, in color by lighting. And the design suggested that. It was a large image like that. That was over the fireplace. Though I don't think he much used the fireplace at all. Though there was one up there. And uh, there was also on that same wall two beautiful Javanese marionettes. Uh, 
which was of, uh, of, great, uh, of great attraction, obviously, to him, as marionettes were. When marionettes were uh, just kind of uh, jokey, uh, clown-like figures, such as we know them more typically, he was not that interested. He was interested in marionettes as, I think I'm quoting him exactly, descendants of the stone images in the old temple. Actually, what he thought was that uh, the marionettes of today, the ones we know more typically, are uh, kind of uh, joke off, uh, joking, uh, joking or playing off the idea of live actors uh, ridiculing them, agreeing with him that most acting was, uh, was not artistic because there was no essential control that the actor could offer out of his human ups and downs. And, uh, well, something he wrote about a great deal, this is uh, getting towards the, uh, the thing I wrote about, uh, which apparently he liked very much. Uh, Craig, from an early point, had started to write about masks. He looked forward to the return of the mask to the theater. And he wrote about that in, in his magazine that was published in Florence, Italy later, The Mask, it was called. And uh, it wasn't only about masks, but he wrote about the use of the mask. But he said, but not copying the ancient masks he said, a creation, not a copy. So when I was 17 and had not yet met Craig, had not yet left the US, I had written that article, Gordon Craig and the Actor. And then I had a section where I wrote about the Uber marionette, the over marionette, as it's better translated. The super marionette is a kind of uh, vague in meaning kind of expression. But the, the fact is that Craig was paraphrasing the philosopher Nietzsche and the, uh, the marionette was for Craig like Nietzsche's expression, uh, the uh, Nietzsche's simp reference to man the marionette as being a kind of uh, substitute for man. And then would come uh, the, the further developed uh, man, the further developed human being who Nietzsche uh, evokes in his writing, being uh, a kind of uh, further developed marionette like the stone images in the old temples that he speaks about. Then would come Nietzsche's expression in German, Übermensch, overman. And I think that's how he sees the marionette as being, and being also only a prelude to the actor of the future, who will then be free to return as a human being because he will have taken on the powers of the marionette and not be like the actors of the past. And when Craig was asked, and he, he, the answer he gave, he repeated later, when he was asked, oh, what is the uber marionette? He actually answered, though the answer is maybe a little obscure, as he would say, he used that word a lot for people. He said, uh, the uber marionette is the actor plus fire minus ego. Uh, quite an extraordinary statement that. I've worked with actors and acting students who gasp when they hear that, even today. And uh, 
the, the uh, article in which I explain the Uber Marionette, I say that it's an extension of the mask to the point of, to the point where it's not just covering the face, but the whole being is in a mask and giving that mask life instead of just using the human body or the mask stopping the expression of the body. That was uh, what I wrote about in that article when I was 17. And it, it's a uh, Craig scholar, Patrick de Boeuf in France, who published an article in which he says that the, uh, that what I wrote about the Uber Marionette was the only explanation that Craig did not write scathing uh, rebukes about. Well, the only one, it's, uh, it's in that magazine. And uh, I never, I liked what I wrote, but I never thought that Craig had that particular reaction to it. But the truth is, Craig never objected to the article. He liked it. And that was maybe the key part of the article. We talked about the actor and he said, uh, I think that maybe if the creator of a theater work would work with one actor alone, that it would be possible to realize the kind of vision of acting that he evokes in his drawings and designs. Well, it has happened to me twice in my life that I have worked with one actor alone, and it was a, 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 an extraordinary event. And uh, significantly, one of the plays I did was based on Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, and the actor, an English actor, Julian Rose, who worked on it with me, went on tour with it with me. And one of the places where we performed it was in this theater, the Gordon Craig Theater, on this stage where we are at this moment. Uh, I uh, emailed Julian where he lives now in Poland and asked him if he could remember the date at all uh, when we did it. I think it was 1980. Uh, I haven't received an answer but I suppose it's on file here. Something that I have worked with in practice is his idea of the stage. His new idea of the stage as being not a vehicle for scenery, but itself capable of movement and taking on forms to such a degree that it might do the movement and the actors not move at all. They make entrances by coming into view because the screens, as he called one version of his movemented stage, have moved and revealed him. And the, the actor and the scene, the stage, can become one, one thing. We used both marionettes and human actors, which was an idea that uh, Craig had proposed to Stanislavski when he was directing the Hamlet in the Moscow Art Theater that has become part of modern theater history. And Stanislavski could only reply, this is for another millennium. Well, it is another millennium. And uh, the, uh, the extreme downstage area, the front of the stage, would be human actors, uh, the uh, the upstage area would be marionettes, the way we work, which suggests a vast perspective. And the screen's also changing in height and in width, so that when Hamlet uh, is far away in another country, he's still in sight. He's still on the stage, played all the way upstage by a marionette, while downstage, Perhaps the king and Laertes are speaking, which was one scene I'm thinking of. Uh, this is still a vision of what Craig would call the theater of the future. The radicalism of it is in the future. You could say, well, today we find things like that. Yes, but they're not the same. Craig wanted these things to become natural 
and part of a, a human vision. Uh, uh, now it's kind of tricky when we do things like that, tricky and satirical. That's not the way Craig thought. Very often, and I've heard it more than once, people say, but if Craig was going to Moscow, why did he work with Stanislavski? What could be more the opposite than Craig and Stanislavski? Why didn't he work with Meyerhold? But uh, I don't think that's true at all. I never heard it from Craig. He didn't speak about it to me. But I really think that Meyerhold's biomechanics is what Craig did not believe in, which was mechanical devices and mechanical means of doing things. He wanted everything to be on a kind of natural level. Even the marionettes, uh, the human hands who he envisioned controlling them were very important to him. Uh, it, it's similar to uh, oh, what he said about uh, lighting, lighting his movemented stage. He said, uh, he said, first the world invented feather pens, then steel pens, uh, and somebody could write their whole letter without once having to dip the pen in ink. And then somebody invented the typewriter. Remember, this is long before computers. He, this was in the 20s that he wrote this, the 1920s. And uh, he said, I would compare the lighting of my scene to the steel pens where you don't have to dip the pen in ink once because there is no break from scene to scene. There's just a constant evolution of the scene in, from one state to another and an unceasing, even if almost imperceptible movement, like the play itself moving from its beginning to its end, not set up or set up another way, but constant, constant, constant. He said, and the lighting would be would be that kind of lighting. It would be constant, constant change, like the change from day to night and from night to day. Um, he actually wrote this. Very often some of his fundamental ideas are not written, or he's accused of not writing them, of not making them more accessible. But if you look in his book called Scene, just the word scene, S-C-E-N-E, S-C-E-N-E, yes. Uh, you will find that uh, section that I just was quoting from. Also, there's something else that I think, I think it's so important that I'll mention it, even though I don't have any proof of it. Uh, Craig talked about the three aspects of the theater as being scene, voice, and action. Uh, he placed scene first. I believe that he thought he will write a book called Voice and a book called Action, and then he'll have the whole new art of the theater recorded. Now, if I'm right, well and good, but in any event, he didn't write such books. He had a school in which uh, the students were very often busy working, and he did tell me that. He said he really believed that uh, students uh, should be sitting, sh should not be sitting, taking notes and uh, learning about this and learning about that. They should be doing things uh, actively. And that was certainly what his students were doing. Uh, they were uh, building models, for example. Uh, his first student during that period was a Californian, an American, uh, Tom Hume. I'm always unsure if it's Tom or Sam, but I think it's Tom Hume. And uh, he, uh, he stayed with Craig a number of years, perhaps culminating in the year of the school. Unfortunately, his school, called the School for the Art of the Theater, uh, a very significant name, because for Craig, there was the theater, and there was the art of the theater. And the art of the theater is a non-existent art 
which has to be created. He was willing to concede that there is an art of architecture, an art of music, for example, but uh, what is the art of the theater? Well, he did make one statement about it. There is certainly enough to excite the creative mind, I think. He said, architecture is the art of space. Music, under which I include poetry, is the art of sound. The theater must be the art of movement. That was, uh, that was really the, the essence of what he believed altogether. And you could say, well, what about all those designs we see of his? Um, he made these wonderful designs. Uh, uh, that's not movement. Yes, it is, because all those designs are like catching at a given moment uh, what is otherwise moving and changing at all times. When I was in Birmingham, uh, speaking, uh, rather the way we're speaking now, a student asked me, who did he feel contemporary with? That's a good question, because he felt contemporary with very few artists. But during, the, during his life, at different times, there were three who he did feel contemporary with. The, uh, the latest one, uh, after the Second World War, was the mime Etienne de Croux, who was really the creator of modern mime in France. And uh, when Craig saw a performance by de Croux, he wrote an article which appeared in French, but of course he wrote it in English. Uh, and uh, I, I'll never forget a particular phrase in the article, I think that I do know by heart and can say. He said, treasures lie at our feet here and there. We must accustom our eyes to see the enchanted seed, our ears to hear the mystic sound. I can't think of a uh, he, you could say, well, what is he saying about what he had seen? That's what he was saying. I can't think of a more meaningful phrase than that. He wrote more. He said, we were present at the creation of an alphabet, an ABC of mime, and more. But that first phrase that I said for you, uh, that was something. So he felt contemporary with de Croo. He felt uh, that they were brother artists, though um, I think de Croo thought of him as more like a father than a brother. Uh, certainly in age, it would have been true. Well then, uh, earlier, around the time of the First World War, around the time of his school, he met the Swiss designer, Adolf Appia, and I think he really believed that Appiah was his only true counterpart. He didn't even know that Appiah was alive, but they became very close. And if you look at Appiah's designs, there's one particularly big book of designs. You can see the Craigianism of them without their looking copied. Uh, like copies of Craig. There are a lot of copies of Craig. And uh, uh, I mean, I, th I think they meant nothing to him. He just ignored them. I think he thought they were beneath contempt. But Appiah is not that. So Appiah was, go uh, was around the middle time. But then an earlier time, the one who he felt contemporary with was the dancer, Isidora Duncan whose movement uh, was the movement uh, that, uh, that Craig envisioned for the theater of the future, as he called it. Uh, though people forget a lot of things. Uh, at that time, it was more difficult than now in the West 
to see the theater of the Orient, the theater of the East. But uh, Craig actually wrote, and again I'm quoting, if the Western theater can become everything I am told that the Eastern theater was and still is, then I withdraw everything that I wrote in my essay, The Actor and the Uber Marionette. He actually wrote that. It's to be seen in another writing. His mother certainly was very happy that it seemed when he was very young uh, that he was going to be a great actor. Um, she, she wrote in her book, The Story of My Life, I think it's called, by Ellen Terry, she wrote, um, instinctively, he did everything right. And she said, I mean the little things that we all have to labor over for years. He just did them. And uh, yet he quit acting when he was 25. Uh, he acted until then because he became interested in the idea of a new theater or, a, or an art of the theater, uh, to use his term. Uh, his father, well, of course, he had very little contact, none, practically none. I guess he saw his father, but practically as a baby. Maybe here. I don't, I don't yet know the history of the family in Stevenage, but of course, when Ellen was about to give birth to him, she came here and uh, had the baby here, and uh, up, uh, they lived in a house that uh, the house is there. Someone lives there, I guess. But then uh, that was where he was as a baby, began to walk in that house, as you were saying earlier. Well, it's true that the, the father figure was terribly important to him in his life. Uh, even his real father, who he didn't know, was still... Uh, terribly important to him. And his mother used to constantly tell him to go and see things, work of his father as an architect. Like, for, for example, uh, uh, some town that he would visit, perhaps to act in, because he left the company of Henry Irving and his mother and began to take independent acting jobs here and there, and if it happened to be a town where there was a building that his father had designed, his mother wanted to be sure he knew it and went to see it. And I know that when, when we performed here uh, in the Gordon Craig Theater, where we are on the stage, where we are right now, I was impressed because the stage looked to me, it was this stage, but maybe it was the arrangement of the Curtains, I don't know, or the tormentors, as they're called in America, on the sides to stop you from seeing too much uh, backstage during a performance. But the stage looked to me singularly long and low. Well, today it does still look pretty long to me, but maybe not as low as it seemed then. And that reminded me of his description of a Greek play which his father had designed, practically directed, I think, but certainly designed. And uh, it was at a place which no longer exists in London called Hengler's Circus. I don't know what, what stands there now, if anything, but that was it. And the Greek play was there. And the stage was very long and very low. Uh, and what Craig wrote, and this I can quote, it's in his book, Ellen Terry and Her Secret Self. He wrote, but the eye could go up, following the high lines behind the stage. That's original, I thought. I'll inherit that. And, and he really did. He had immensely admired uh, the actor, Henry Irving, and he said, he actually said, uh, Henry Irving is the nearest there has come to the uber marionette.
That's what he said. And he also said that Irving's face was a mask. And, and the mask would evolve into different shapes, but it was a mask. Oh, this is reminding me of something that I think could be said, that, uh, that while, while Craig and Isadora had such an affinity with each other, Isadora Duncan, also uh, she, oh, she believed in the human body and its movement. And he felt that the human being was bringing out his own greatness more when he created something outside of his person. Uh, that would be like what? Music, like his moving scene, or perhaps the Uber marionette. Well, of course, people could say, which he practically answered, as you know from what I quoted to you before. They could say, well, what is it finally that, that he, uh, he wants a, a marionette of some kind or he wants a human being? And I think it's that he sees the marionette as, as a kind of evolutionary step towards a reborn human actor literally reborn in a new form. And I think those things I quoted to you, like the Uber marionette is the actor plus fire minus ego. Uh, that already suggests that. Uh, I, I, I've heard him use some pretty strong language about the innovative theater already when he was still alive. And uh, maybe I shouldn't repeat. <laughs> no, he's, he definitely, uh, it, it, it made no impression on him whatsoever. Oh, he, I can think of one thing that he said that might surprise people. He said to me once, uh, and I regarded it as part of my learning, he said, you'll find that there are two kinds of theater. There's the artistic theater, and there's the commercial theater. And I almost think, he said, that the commercial theater is better. And I understood that he meant that the artistic theater was not artistic enough. In other words, it, was, it wasn't the art of the theater that he envisioned. Whereas the commercial theater, he felt, is a, a good form of uh, experience and learning and doesn't make false claims about itself. And uh, I think there's something in that. He enjoyed uh, English Music Hall very, very much and uh, would even remember whole songs and things like that that were performed and uh, used to sing them for me. And uh, something that he liked very, very much, though it isn't really musical, but it's related, is the opera by Reginald de Coven, I remember the composer's name, called Robin Hood. And uh, I, I guess de Coven was English, I think so. And uh, that was where uh, he sang um, the song Brown October Ale about Robin Hood, and he sang it several times for me. He liked it that I enjoyed it, and so I learned it too. And the two of us used to sing it together at a big cafe in the center of, of Vence, uh, not for an audience, but just we were outside in the sun uh, at a table where there were sometimes other people, uh, including members of his family sometimes. And the two of us would uh, sing Brown October Ale. And uh, he and I both loved that. And the people around seemed, <laughs> seemed to tolerate it. Yeah. He sometimes would say things that he knew were outrageous, and yet he wouldn't say them if he didn't mean them. So he said to me uh, one day, with a very serious look, he said, I think 
the best thing most parents can leave their children is the news of their decease. And uh, he could continue to look at me very seriously. And I remember that he said, uh, after a moment's silence, he said, seems a terrible thing to say. And I still didn't say anything. So he said, nonetheless true. Well, you know, I think one of his uh, late statements that he made in his life, which has been published, uh, and uh, it just seems to me to be possible answer, like how to be remembered, you know. Uh, he said, uh, by bending to the wind, I have prevailed in my dream for the theater. In my heart, the dear theater as it is. In my soul, the theater as it shall be.